So maybe I make a quick introduction and uh, Professor uh, Santiago Barcero is an Associate Professor of Business at a Graduate School of Business, Columbia University, and a Senior Research Scientist at Google Research. His research develops novel methodological approaches that combine dynamic optimization, stochastic modeling, and game theory to address fundamental problems in the digital economy. His work tackles central problems in internet advertising while making methodological contributions to the area of large-scale sequential decision-making in the face of uncertainty and the dynamic optimization with incentives. His research has been recognized by numerous awards, including a Best Dissertation Award and the multiple Best Paper Awards. He serves as an associate editor for the Informs flagship journals, management science, operations research, and the manufacture and the service operations management. So now let's uh, hear. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for for having yeah. me. So I know that it's very late in China. So I appreciate. <laughs> You accommodating uh, the time differences. Uh, Recording in progress. Good. Yes. So, so today I'm going to talk about the best of many worlds: uh, dual mirror design for online allocation problems. Uh, and this is uh, joint work with Hei Hao Lu, who is at the University of Chicago, and Bahad Mirokni, who is at Google Research. So, the motivation of this work. Give me a second. So the motivation of of this work is uh, our online allocation problems. Online allocation problems are central problems in computer science and operational research, and they have this structure where you have requests arriving repeatedly over time, and for each request we need to choose an action. This action is going to generate a reward and it's going to consume some resources, and our goal is to maximize the cumulative reward subset to this uh, resource uh, constraint. There are a lot of applications. I'm going to try to mention these applications later today. For example, it could be like online allocation of, of ads, where uh, resources could be budget, uh, revenue management, in when resources could be like inventory of, of a product, and allocation of, of food donations. Now, what's the challenge is that in many cases, uh, information about future requests is not known in advance. You have to make a decision today you know what the current action is going to uh, consume in terms of resources, what the rewards are going to generate, but you don't know what's going to happen in the future. So for this reason, we need is we need to design data-driven algorithms that can make decisions on the fly without knowing what the future is going to uh, hold. So bottom line up front, so let me tell you uh, in advance what's the, the goal of this work. So we introduce an algorithm called online dual mirror descent. And actually, this is not just one algorithm, but it's a family of algorithms that have like a very simple structure. In essence, they are dual-based algorithms that are going to maintain a weight for each resource. So this weight, you can think about like a bid price in the context of revenue management, or more generally, you can think about like a Lagrange multiplier in the context of optimization. And what we're going to do is we're going to take action greedily using weight-adjusted rewards. So we're going to maximize rewards greedily, but then we're going to take into account the weights to uh, to to incorporate the opportunity cost of, of consuming resources. And then we're going to update weights using mirror descent. And we're going to explain what is mirror de descent uh, shortly. Now, why are we excited about this algorithm? Well, these algorithms are simple. They are easy to implement and tune. We're going to show it later that in many cases, you can implement this in linear time. They're extremely simple. Uh, there's no need to solve auxiliary optimization problems. And also, they have like one or two parameters that, that you can play with. So there's not a lot of tuning that is required. Also, these are very flexible algorithms. So the same algorithm can handle like non-convex problems. And we'll be discussing in other papers, you can incorporate 
regularization, other constraints, and so on. It provides like a very general framework. And in terms of performance, then these are theoretically justified. We're going to give worse guarantees on the performance of these algorithms for different uh, regimes. In particular, we show in this paper, this algorithm is robust in the sense that this single algorithm works well against stochastic and adversarial inputs, even without knowing what kind of inputs uh, you're facing. And as I mentioned, like kind of mirror the same provides a flexible framework. And by changing how you measure distance in the algorithm, then you can re recover different algorithms like gradient descent and multiplicative the weight updates that are perhaps the most popular algorithm in online optimization. Then we can put them without uh, within this uh, framework. Okay. So again, I don't see your faces. So then if you have any questions at any point in time, feel free to raise your hand or to interrupt me. Uh, I'm glad to take uh, any questions as we move uh, forward. Good. So in terms of related work, I just want to mention that online allocation problems are central problems, and they have been studied for quite a bit of time. Uh, at first, so let me bring the pointer here. At first, like this algorithm were studied in the case of stochastic input with known distribution. So this is like a Bayesian model in which you know all the distribution of the inputs. It's a long line of work in OR uh, management science on these sort of problems. Now, in that case, if you know all the distribution, you can think about this as a dynamic programming problem. Now, the problem is that the state space is too large and people have been looking at designing heuristics that perform well. But those algorithms have the limitation that you need to feed them Bayesian priors on the inputs, which in, 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 in real life, these are hard to, to estimate. So then in the last decades, there was like focus on, on looking at the case of stochastic input with a known distribution. So the, the idea here is that we're going to assume that there is an underlying stochastic model, but you as a decision maker, you don't know it. And there are three different generations of algorithms. The first generations, going back to the one around Hayes and Feldman et al., they look at training-based algorithms. What is the idea of those training-based algorithms is that you have like an horizon, so what you do is you, you use the first like epsilon time periods to feed a model. And then once you feed your model, once you train your model, you come up with a policy and then you implement it in the rest of the horizon. So this is like a very simple and intuitive idea. Now the problem is that they attain suboptimal regret and most of them are only restricted to linear optimization uh, problems. Then there, there is like a second generation that try to look at like kind of near optimal uh, regret. And then the basic idea of this algorithm is that instead of doing this once, they try to do it periodically. So they require solving like auxiliary optimization problem, not at the beginning, but as you collect more data, you, you solve these problems. And then with that, you can obtain near optimal performance. Now, these algorithms are very nice theoretically, but in practice, Unfortunately, you are not implementable because you need to solve these this large optimization problems. And in many applications, when you have to make a decision on the fly, this is very time consuming. So then the, the third generation, and this actually where we contribute, is on, on developing uh, fast algorithms. So these are algorithms that require solving no auxiliary optimization problems. And actually, you can run them in, in linear time. And I want to give a shout out to this paper of uh, Yin Yu Ye and uh, Xiao Chen Li, also that they also look at this algorithm and they're very similar to what we discussed here. Now they only consider the case of upgrading descent, and they only give bounds for like a stochastic input. So we give bounds for marginal input models, and we have like tighter bounds. But then these two papers are simultaneous and propose like similar algorithms. Then there is an idea of work that I'm going to mention regarding adversarial inputs, where you assume nothing about the words. And in that case, they look at like more structured problems and they give like finite competitive ratios. And we also contribute to the line of work on uh, stochastic and adversarial inputs where we have a mixture of these two. And I'm going to mention this a little bit in detail. Now, let me introduce the, the model. So this is the model. It's a very basic model in which you have like a, a finite horizon with t time periods. You're going to have n different resources. 
and each resources are each resource are going to have uh, a, cap a capacity bj that's going to be the initial capacity of the resources in each time period we're going to receive a request what is a request it's going to be a, a tuple with three components the first component is going to be a reward function that's going to map our actions to rewards it's going to go from our decision set in rd to the real numbers then a consumption function is going to tell us for each action which how much i want to consume of each of the different resources going to go to rm one per resources and then the action set is going to tell us which actions are feasible in each uh, point in time and that's going to be again in rd and what's the timing again for each time period you receive this tuple with the functions and the set you take an action and based on the action you collect a reward and you consume resources in terms of the assumptions, two assumptions, we're going to assume that there are no replenishment. So that means that you start with resources and resources are going to be only consumed monotonically. And then the other assumption is that we're going to assume that there exists a null action. That is in some, if you play this action, that could be like, for example, zero, then you don't consume a re any resource. And this action is very important to guarantee feasibility. Because you can always stop taking actions and guarantee that you never consume all your resources. So what's the offline problem? So this will be the problem if you knew everything in advance. If I tell you all the reward functions, all the resource consumption functions, and the set, you're going to pick the actions x to maximize the sum of the rewards, such a constraint that say like the total capacity, the total consumption is less than the capacity. And these are vector constraints. So this, you think about this as B as a vector, and B is also a function uh, that is a vector function. OK, so this is the offline optimization problem. Here, I want to emphasize that functions and action sense can be non-convex. And this I'm going to explain later is very important for the application. For example, when we talk about like assortment optimization, on bidding and repeated options, the, the, the action set or the reward functions are going to be non convex They could, could be, for example, discrete, step functions, and so on. And this is very important because it, it shows kind of that our uh, methodology is very general. Now, what we're going to do again is we're going to try to solve this problem, but we need an online uh, algorithm. Now, what is an online algorithm? An online algorithm A is going to make decisions XT based on the current request and the observed history, but doesn't know the future. It does know the length of the horizon, and this is important. You need to know how many opportunities you have and also the initial capacities. And of course, the algorithm needs to be feasible in the sense that the total resources consumed should be less than the capacity. And we go when I know by R of A, the cumulative rewards. That's going to be how much we collected throughout the horizon that is just the sum of the actions uh, the, the functions evaluated at our actions good now in order to talk about algorithm we need to discuss the input models now the input models are going to govern how our requests uh, generated and we're going to consider as i mentioned different input models on one extreme, they have like the case of stochastic IID from an unknown distribution. So as I mentioned before, in this world, we are assuming that there is an underlying distribution from which these requests are drawn. And this distribution is not known to the decision maker. Okay, you only know that there is another line distribution. Now, this is a very kind of optimistic model because we are assuming a lot from the environment, we're assuming the existence of an underlying statistical model. And the upside of, of that is that you can actually design algorithms that are nearly optimal, that if you have enough opportunities and your budgets, the, your capacities are large enough, then you can get as close as you want to the uh, perfect solution in hindsight. That's great. But what's the trade-off is that you are assuming a lot about the environment. And in many cases, algorithms that are optimized for this uh, setting end up being fragile. If these assumptions are not true, then the performance that it can get, the, it, it can be uh, terrible. So if you want robustness, on the other extreme, what we have is the case of 
adversarial input. So here we're assuming nothing about the environment. Actually, we have like uh, we, we, we can imagine that we have an adversary that is choosing the request online in order to hurt us the most. And this adversary knows our algorithm and knows our past uh, actions. Now, the beauty of this adversarial setting is again that you're assuming nothing about the environment. So then you're going to have like performance guarantee that hold no matter what. But of course, life is about trade off. And here, the trade off is that the performance that you can attain is typically lower. You cannot uh, hope to get near optimal algorithms. What you, the best that you can obtain is a fixed competitive ratio. You can show an algorithm that attain like a, a constant approximation from the optimal uh, performance in Hansard. As I mentioned, these are the two extremes. So these are nice. We would like to cover those. But life is not fully adversarial, nor like fully stochastic. So we also want to consider like kind of uh, other inputs that are in between. The first one is this one of our serial corruptions of IID input. That this is like an uh, an input model that has like received like a uh, quite a bit of attention in the last few years in the computer science uh, and machine learning community. And the idea here is that you start with a stochastic IID input, but then you imagine that you have an adversary that takes a fraction of this request and perturb it arbitrarily. Okay. And we want to show is we want to design algorithms that perform well when the input is, is IID and whose performance degrade gracefully with the amount of corruption. Is that if you increase the corruption, then the algorithm, the performance, is, okay, you may not be near optimal, but then you're going to degrade uh, gracefully. And this is important because some of the algorithms that I mentioned before, for example, those training based algorithms that I mentioned, and those algorithms that require using the first batch of data to build the model, these are very fragile. And here, the adversary, even if, you co if the adversary corrupts a few critical time periods, then your estimations are wrong, and the whole performance is off. So then your algorithm should not pay attention too much on any single request, and if you want to uh, aim to do better in this sort of model. And then there are other models that we consider is that, that those co uh, allow input to be uh, correlated or have like periodicity. And we capture correlation using the notion of ergodicity. And what's the idea is like, if you think about stochastic IID, you are assuming that two requests that are next to each other are fully independent. Now in practice, things are not fully independent. If you take two requests that are close to each other, perhaps they are correlated because it could be the like similar users that are connected. So we want to allow some degree of correlation across time. And we capture that using the notion of ergodicity. And also, we want to allow the, the input to have like periodicity or seasonality. Now, for example, if you think about like advertising, and we do a lot of work on advertising, suppose that you have like your horizon is a month. Now, if you think about a month, then each day is roughly the same. But within each, each day, mornings and evenings are very different. Because in the morning, people are connecting from the work. And in the evening, people are connecting from their job. So then you may have like patterns that are going to repeat. So I see a question. Give me a minute and let me finish this slide and then I'm going to take the question. And then what we do here is we, need, we aim to seek uh, to design algorithms that are oblivious to the input model, that don't, don't know which input model they are facing. And without knowing which input model they are facing, they can still attain good performance uh, across uh, the board. That's our goal. Uh, with our work. Yes, so question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just a quick question. So the adversary is not uh, playing a game against the algorithm. They are just like, uh, we try to design algorithm which is good in all the different cases discussed here, right? What do you mean not, not playing a game? In, in concrete it's thing? like uh, adversary is, adversary doesn't have a utility function. Oh, they have. Well, you can think about the, the adversary as being like it's a zero sum game that, that you want to maximize performance mm -hmm. and the performance could be regret. You know? So think about like you as a, as a player, mm -hmm. you want to uh, minimize regret mm -hmm. and then the adversary wants to maximize regret. So then you can think this as a, as a, as a zero sum game. 
and then you have like uh -huh. kind of a, a, a kind of a min max formulation of regrets. So then you uh -huh. as a you want to minimize, and the adversary wants to maximize. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then Thanks. this interpretation is useful because, like, actually, when when we prove uh, harness results, mm -hmm. we use like a Yao's lemma, no? And then like Yao's lemma is essentially trying to mm -hmm. think about like kind of this as a game and the adversary using like kind of uh, randomized strategies so that we can apply like kind of a minimax inequality. So yeah, so the, you can think this as a game. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Good. Uh, 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 hello, I want to ask a question. Uh, what's the meaning of the ergodic in this model? Is it that there is a state uh, that can be uh, uh, like a Markov chain model or anything else? Yes, Thank yes, you. good, good, good. So unfortunately, I wouldn't get into all the details, but yeah, you can imagine that the, the input is governed by an underlying Markov chain, okay? Okay, uh, thank you. Instead of being IID, the, there is an underlying state. Now, what's important is that the state is exogenous. Your actions are not affecting the state. This is, but this state is, uh, is uh, evolving uh in an exogenous manner but and uh, um, what we're going to assume is that the the markov chain is fast mixing if the markov chain is fast mixing then you get like good regret guarantee if it's slow mixing you can still get vanishing regret but then your regret guarantees are going to depend on how fast it mixes. but yeah so the best way to think about it is think about like being a markov chain um, um okay i think that this might be connected to the a rested bandit model or something is that like that yeah you can think about that in that way you're gonna going to wear restless in the sense that they evolve even if you don't pull a, an action yes okay thank you good so how do we actually solve this problem so the algorithms are extremely intuitive and they are based on lagrangian duality so what's the idea of lagrangian duality this is one of the key ideas in, in optimization and what we try to do is we're going to try to take our problem and decompose it into simple problems. Why can't we do that? Well, if you think about the master problem, the master problem is complicated because we have like this resource constraint that is linking our actions across time. The idea of Lagrangian duality is that we're going to introduce a Lagrange multiplier for the resource constraint. It's going to be a vector mu in the reals, in the positive reals, actually. Yeah. Uh, one for each resource constraint. And what we do is we consider a Lagrangian problem in which we move the co constraints to your objective and then we penalize the relation of the constraint using this Lagrange multiplier. So here we have the constraints and the constraints, we remove them. So they're no longer constraints. Now, when you do so, the beauty of you doing so is that now you can do some manipulation. For example, I can, again, this new T mu b is going to be a constant so I, I can take it out and now what's going to happen is that the problem is going to uh, decouple across time before you have like this master optimization now you don't have any other constraint linking decisions across time so instead of having like a optimization over all the time periods you're going to have like one optimization per period and in this optimization problem what's going on is that you're maximizing rewards but then you have like the Lagrange multiplier here. So here, what you think about is that now in each optimization problem, you're maximizing reward, but then you're using the Lagrange multiplier to account for the opportunity cost of consuming resources. And this is essentially the price you pay for consuming resources. Yes, you can take action readily, but then these are gonna be costly for you. And then by choosing the right prices, you can coordinate actions across time. And this is kind of the key insight here that if you know the right Lagrange multiplier, then the actions are simple. In each time period, you're going to maximize the reward and then use mu to price uh, the resources. Okay. And actually, from with duality, what do we get? We get that for every dual variable, the dual function here provides a bound on up. So then this gives you already an upper bound on, on performance. Now, in order for this theory to be useful, then what we need is that we need that the duality gap to be small. We need the difference between this upper bound and up to be close to, to each other. And actually another key insight is that if you pick the optimal dual variable, so then this provides an upper bound for each mu. Now, if you minimize over mu and you look for the tightest possible bound, 
then what happens in this sort of problem is that the difference between opt and the dual uh, optimal solution uh, is going to be tend to be small. It won't grow with the size of the problem. And then this is a very deep fundamental result. Again, we don't use these results in our in our paper, but this is connected with some results that go back to a, a many decades back to two per second that they exploit like the geometry of these problems to show that actually the duality gap is not too big. So why is this useful? Well, the key idea is that if you know good Lagrange multipliers, you can pick the optimal Lagrange multipliers, then you could take actions greedily in this way. And then because the duality gap is small, then perhaps we can show that the performance in the primal space induced by this policy is actually uh, good enough. So that's kind of at the high level, the idea of our paper. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that we don't know the optimal Lagrange multipliers. Now, in practice, the optimal dual variables are not known in advance. Why? Because in order to compute the dual variables, you need to be able to solve this dual problem that requires knowing all the requests. That's not something that, that we don't know. So how do we compute good dual variables? Then we're going to do this as follows. We're going to generate online guesses. We're going to start with the first guess of the dual variable, and then we're going to generate online guesses by minimizing the dual function in real time. OK? How do we do so? Well. The dual function is this object over here. So here you see the dual function is that you have like the sum over t time periods. So we're going to do is we're going to minimize each term at a time because we don't know the whole dual function. But in each time period, we learn a new component. So we're going to minimize that component uh, at a time. And how do we do so? Well, at time t, we face this dual objective function. No, suppose that. This is the objective function that we're finding, and this is our guess from ut. Now, suppose you want to take like kind of a one iteration to minimize this function. Now, how do you do so? Well, we can we can try to do we, we if we want to use, for example, a first order method, then we need to compute a gradient. Now, can we compute a gradient? And the answer is yes. If you want to take the derivative of this with respect to mu, first you're going to have this b over t. So in the gradient, you're going to have b over t. Then the next part is, can we take the derivative with respect to this maximization problem? Well, this maximization problem, because it is the supremum of linear function, is always going to be convex. And actually, using Daskin theorem, we can show that subgradients are easy to compute. A subgradient, what we need to do is we need to take the derivative of the inner objective with respect to mu. That's going to be minus b. That's going to be the derivative. And then what you do is you evaluate at an optimal solution of that optimization. If xt is the optimal action under mu t, that gives you this term over here. So then a gradient you can compute. Why? Because b over t is just how much budget you should spend over time period. That's the total resources over time. And bt xt is that if you take an action using the current dual variable, then this is how much you should you actually spend. So then if you compare what you should spend on average versus what you actually spend, that difference actually is a dual uh, subgradient. So then we, at each point in time, we we'll receive a new function. We, re we can compute a gradient. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to minimize this dual function on the fly. And we're going to update the dual variables using an online first order optimization algorithm. There are many choices you can do, but a natural choice is uh, to use mirror uh, descent. I'm going to explain what's the idea of mirror descent uh, shortly. Any questions so far? Uh, may I ask I a question? question? Oh, sorry. Yes, please. Uh, no, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, please go ahead. You can go ahead, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the definition of um, optimal um, OPT on the adversary situation? Uh, here? Yeah. Well, uh, here you can think about like kind of in hindsight, no? So after all the sequence of, of functions, have been released, then you go back in time and you say, like, what, what are the best actions that I could have taken? This is essentially 
the solution of this optimization problem? Um, whether we should use the fixed policies to define OPT? No, here we're not using a fixed policy. This is important. This is a big distinction with bandits algorithm. For example, we're not comparing against a fixed static action. Uh, what we're doing is that we are actually comparing to a strategy that is potentially a changing with time. So this, these actions are not static. Okay, thank you. There was another question too. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, 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 could you please switch to the page nine, I suppose? Uh, yes. Or uh, the key, yeah, the key inside number three. So, so uh, does that mean that um, if the primal dual gap is very small, then if we reach the optimal dual variables, the corresponding, um, you know, opti um, primal variables that solved the above like range uh, maximization is close to the optimal solution of the primal problems? Uh, not really, you need to be careful. No, because when you when you do so, you care about primal feasibility too. So oh, the, okay. yeah, so then it's, it can, this is just like kind of a heuristic argument, but in practice, if you plug it in there, then you also care about primal feasibility because the action that you generate may not be uh, feasible. What we show is that actually that's almost the case. They are almost feasible. Uh, in the sense that if you stop, at, if you continue to take that action and then you stop early, then you don't miss much. But that requires like an argument. You also need to show that there's some sort of like kind of like approximate complementary slack. So then it's, it's more delicate than that. Okay, thanks. But, but um, is there any like theoretical guarantees on that? Uh, if the primal problem is uh, primal solutions are guaranteed can be guaranteed to to be feasible all the time. Uh, no, actually, I, I can okay. give you an example. I can give you an example where I actually give you the optimal dual variable, and then you pick the action here to maximize the Lagrangian, and then yeah. that 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 solution is terrible. Okay. Uh, thanks. Again, uh, uh, un unless you can show that this problem has like some nice structure. That it has a unique solution and some some strong concavity, and you need more and more assumption. But without any assumptions, if this is linear, for example, then you can show that it can, it can be terrible. It can be as bad okay. as I want. So, so even if that the above arguments do not hold, the the dual mirror descent still um, perform very well. Yes, yes. So then our algorithm would not use these things. In uh, it's going to provide like another proof. Unfortunately, I, I can't explain all the details in this talk. Okay. Uh, but actually, what we show is we show some some, some sense of like kind of approximate complementary slackness that guarantees this. But that that requires extra work. Thanks. Thanks. Good. So for those of you that are not familiar, let me give you a quick uh, recap of mirror descent. So mirror descent is just like a first order method for common optimization. Now suppose I have this function w of mu that I'm trying to minimize. So this is w of mu on the right. Here axis is your decision variable mu, and your current solution is mu t, and the effective value is mu of, of t. Now, if you try to minimize this function, what you can try to do, if you have access to a subgradient, suppose I have a subgradient g, what I can do, I can construct a first order approximation. The first order approximation is going to be the function value times the gradient and the difference of, of, this, of the variables. So then this is going to be my, my first order linear approximation. So the basic idea of first order method is that if you have this linear approximation, then instead of minimizing the function, you minimize the linear approximation that is easier to minimize. Now, minimizing linear approximation as it is is not a good idea because you see here that if you want to minimize it, then you're going to move and choose a mu that is very large. But what do we know? We typically know that first order approximations are only good locally. So what we try to do is that the new iterate is obtain, obtained by minimizing a local linearization while guaranteeing that we don't move too far away from the previous point. How we do so, well, what we do is we choose a new point to minimize the linear approximation, but also we put a penalty. And this penalty essentially is gonna penalize for moving away. It's just gonna be the difference between, the distance between my current solution, sorry, my current solution and the new point. 
And then this one over n, eta, sorry, think about like kind of uh, a coefficient that tells you how much weight you put to the penalty. So then if you add a penalty, then you're going to get this black line over here, okay? Because as you move farther away, the penalty increase. And then now if I choose to minimize that penalty, then I'm going to move to this point over here. Now, two observations here by minimizing the, the linearization. When you minimize the linearization, there are many terms that are constant, which you don't care about. So the only term that you care about is gt mu. And then how do you measure distance? Well, you can use different notions of distance. Mirror descent, what it's going to do is going to use a notion of distance that is the Bregman divergence. It's not really a distance because it doesn't satisfy uh, the symmetry axioms, but it's kind of it's useful because it allows to capture many different uh, algorithms. So that's the basic idea. You minimize a, a, a linear approximation and then you penalize from moving away using the Bregman divergence. And with that, we have all the ingredients for our algorithm. So the algorithm goes as follows. It's going to take as initial uh, as input an initial dual solution mu, step size, and a reference function. The reference function essentially is going to determine the distance that we use in the in mirror descent. For each time period, we're going to observe a request. Then we determine an action. How? Well, we maximize the rewards minus mu times the resource consumption. So this is like kind of the weighted adjusted objective with the current reward. We take this action if we have enough resources. Otherwise, if we don't have enough resources, we just take this null action that guarantees feasibility. Then what we do is we observe how much we consume, and we do that to update the remaining of resources. We just subtract what we consume, and then we update dual variables using mirror descent. So remember mirror descent, what we do is we minimize mu times the gradient. Now the gradient we have it, it was B over T divided how much we consume. And then we use the breakman diversions here as a notion of distance. Okay, so this is the algorithm. Five very simple steps. This first step, the, sorry, this second step, determining an action is an optimization problem. I'm gonna give you next three examples in which we can actually sol solve it efficiently or in closed form. So in many cases you can solve it. And even if you cannot solve it exactly, if you only have like an approximation or uh, an epsilon solution, then you can use those and those are gonna to translate to your performance bars. And then the next point is about this Bregman, this step over here that this seems like a very complicated uh, step. Actually, I'm gonna show you next that in many cases you can actually come up with a very simple update. Point. Before we get there, I wanna make sure that there are no questions. Okay, so let me uh, instantiate this for some examples. In terms of the, the distance, what you can try to use is that the first natural notion of distance is using the Euclidean norm. What if you use Euclidean norm as a, as a distance? Then if you figure out the math in green descent, you're gonna obtain that the step size is gonna, the, sorry, the update is gonna be exactly online gradient descent. So what we mean is that the next dual variable is just gonna be the old dual variable minus the eta times the gradient. So this is just gradient descent in the sense that you are just subtracting the gradient. And what we do is we take the maximum with zero, we project to the non-negative order to guarantee that dual variables are non-negative. Now, well, as a notion of distance, what you can use instead is you can use the, K, uh, the KL diversions. If you use the KL diversions, what you're going to get, you're going to get like online multiplicative weights. So instead of doing the weights additively, you, uh, you update the dual variables multiplicatively. You just take the new dual variables to be the exponential, the old dual variables times the exponential of the gradient. So instead of adding gradients, you just multiply, uh, you take uh, exponential. Okay, so depending on different notions, you get different updates. And these are very simple updates. Again, it's just subtracting numbers. So then you can do this in, in linear time. Let me give some intuition for what the algorithm is doing, just to understand why we're using these update rules. Now, what's the intuition? Now, what we, B over T is how much we should spend on, on average. On average, we try to consume resources evenly so that we don't miss good opportunities near the end. 
Suppose that we have a request that spends more resources than the target. So then what happened for this request is that when we spend B is greater than our target. In that case, this difference over here is going to be negative. And then we have a minus in front. So then the total thing will be positive and then will be increased the dual variable. So that means that if we spend more than the target, then the dual variable is increased. Now, if the dual variable increase, in the next 10 periods, resources are priced higher. And if resources are priced higher, then it's more costly for you to consume resources. So then you're going to take actions that consume less resources. So future actions are going to consume resources more conservatively. So what happens is that if you spend more than the target, in the future, you spend less. And if you spend less than the target, then in the future, you're going to spend more aggressively. So then the algorithm have this very natural self-correcting feature that are going to track how much you spend on average and try to compare what you actually spend and change the dual variables in a way that you guarantee like kind of uniform uh, uh, resource consumption. Okay, that's something that we obtained for free. And this is what it's going to uh, drive its robustness property to a, a large degree. So kind of to make it a little bit more concrete, let me discuss some applications, how we can use our algorithms and application. Let me start with the first one that is called online linear programming. So this is one of the basic models in which we're assuming that the reward function and the resource consuming functions are linear. So for the reward function, we have like a revenue vector that changes with time. And the, our rewards are going to be the inner product of, this, of the, our action on the reward. And then for the consumption, we have a consumption maker. And the decision maker choose an action in, in some set. Again, this is a model that has a lot of applications. One application is the uh, classical problem of network revenue management by Talurian by Rising, in which our decision is binary, zero or one. We have a request and we need to decide whether to accept it or to reject it. And lots of applications to airlines, hospitality, railways, clay computing, where you have like consumers showing up and you need to decide whether you take it or not. Another application is online matching. Going back to CARP and, and Feldman, again, lots of applications to advertising, thing exchange, and food donation. And here, the difference is that the decision set is going to be the unit simplex, and it's going to have the dimension of the resources. Now, when the request has arrived, what I need to decide, instead of a self reject, I need to decide to which resource I'm going to I'm gonna uh, uh, assign it to. So here, the CT matrix is diagonal. So how does our action look like? Let's look at the case of network revenue management. So what's our action? Remember, we take the action to maximize the reward minus mu times resource consumption. The reward is, is RTX. This is CX. So here we can extract X and the decision is zero one. So this is very simple. What you do is you compare the reward versus the opportunity cost of consuming resources. And if that's positive, you take it, otherwise it's negative. So this is what is called a bid price control. And it's a very simple control where you just compare how much revenue you get against how much, uh, what's the cost of consuming resources. So then in this case, you can, that problem, you can solve it in closed form. Let me give you another example. This is a problem of, of bidding in, in repeated auction with, with budget. And actually we, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, exploring this problem. And this is the case of an advertiser who bids in a, a repeated second price auction to maximize total rewards subject to a budget constraint. So think about the advertiser. In this case, has an only one resource constraint that corresponds to the budget B of dollars. In each auction, the advertiser is going to have a value BT. And the actions that the advertiser is going to determine is going to bid XT for auction T. How much should I bid for the auction? What do I observe? I observe. In the case of winning, the second highest bid. If I win, I observe what was the second highest bid. If I lose, I observe nothing. This is up in this case. So let me write up down. So what's the reward function? So remember, we're maximizing utility. Utility is the difference between your value and the payment. D is the second highest competing bid because of the second price auction. That's what you pay if you win. But then you're only going to win. This is going to be the indicator that you win if your bid is greater than the highest competing bid. Remember, in the second price auction, what happens is the highest bidder wins. And if you win, you pay the second highest bid. 
So then this corresponds to the utility function. And then for the consumption function, we're going to have, again, the win indicator that in, if you win, if your bid X is greater than the highest competing bid DT, you pay the second highest competing bid. And here I want to emphasize that these functions are nonlinear because if your action is your bid, if your bid is below the second highest bid, then you get zero utility. And if it's above, then you get positive utility. So this is going to be a step function, and this is nonlinear. So that's why we need a, a methodology that allows to incorporate uh, such nonlinear function. Now, if you think carefully about this model, a priori, it seems that it doesn't fit our framework. Why? Because in our model, we're assuming that we know requests in advance before making a decision. But in this auction example, you don't fully know requests in advance because you don't know the second highest competing bid in advance. Interestingly, this doesn't matter. If the auction is truthful, like a second price auction, then you actually can compute bids without knowing the, what the competition is doing. And let me explain. Let's go back to our algorithm. Step two, how do we compute the optimal action? X T star is going to be the R max of reward minus mu time decision, uh, time resource consumption. Let me plug in. Remember the reward was B minus D, indicator that you win. Resource consumption was D times mu indicator that you win. So then this is the problem that we need to solve. And X is my B. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one plus mu and I'm going to divide everything with Y plus mu to write it in this way. So then the same optimal solution. And then now if you look at this closely, this is exactly equal to the problem faced by a bidder bidding in a second price auction in which your value is B over one plus mu. And because the auction is truthful, what you should do, you should bid your value. But in this case, your value is not B anymore, it's B over one plus mu. So the optimal strategy is B over one plus mu. So what we need to do is we need to shade bids by a constant factor and how much we shade the bids are gonna, it's gonna depend on the, on the Lagrange multiplier, okay? So then even if we don't know the competing bid because the auction is truthful, we can still like kind of uh, determine how to be. Any questions? Yeah, hi Santiago. So, uh, uh, okay, so I'm not uh, quite, I do not quite understand why we need the auction is truthful because uh, uh, because uh, we don't have any information on DT. So uh, even if it's not a truthful auction, uh, I think the formula also works. And not really. For example, if this is a first price option, uh, in a first price okay. option, actually, yeah, you need to care how to share your bids because of the competition. So, the, for example, if this is a first price option, this doesn't uh, apply anymore. So, you need to have an understanding on how this competition uh, behaving. So, if you want, like, kind of, I can discuss that offline because we, we have done some work on that too. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't apply to a first price option. Right. So, so. Uh... Uh, can I think the key point here is that the uh, formula of FT is irrelevant with the bid? I beg your pardon? Uh, yep. So so because uh, the auction is truthful, so that uh, the F F function is irrelevant with the bid. So so the the uh, above formula can be right. So if the F is uh, relevant with the bid, and the whole formula does not work anymore, is is that the case? So I don't know what you refer by relevant. What do you mean by relevant for the bid? Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, that is to say the the bid uh, the bid value occurs or it appears in the formula of uh, the the reward function. But it does appear in the formula here. The bid. Yeah. Sure. So so uh, if it uh, if it appears in the in the formula, so so the uh, I think the uh, the nice problem may not work anymore. So yeah. So if, if for example, if you, if in the first price auction X would be here, yeah, B will be here, and that wouldn't work anymore. So that's kind of the, okay. the the key the key important aspect there. Okay. Thank you. Good. Another example again is that of personal access of formula optimization. Let me uh, explain this quickly because I'm running out of time. But you can think about a retailer that is with limited inventory that we need to decide which assortment of products to offer. And here, 
in this application, what's interesting is that the retailer has n products and it's going to choose an assortment. It's going to choose a subset f of products to offer. So here the decision is going to be a subset. So the cardinality of the decision space is exponential in the size of the problem. Interestingly, in our, algo, in our uh, theoretical result, we have no dependence on the cardinality of the decision set. So we can apply our algorithms in this case. So for example, let me not go through the details, but if you assume that the demand follows like a multinomial logic model with changing attractiveness, then you can still apply our algorithm. You can compute the optimal assortment in linear time. And you can also show that regret bound doesn't grow with the cardinality of the number of assortments. So let me skip this, but I want to mention that this is an example where you have like kind of uh, discrete uh, choices and you can still apply our theory. So let me get to the theoretical results. So in terms of the theoretical results, we first look at the case of stochastic IID input. Now here we're assuming that requests are drawn IID from an unknown distribution. Again, there's a distribution of request P, uh, but then these are known to the decision maker. And then what we're going to assume, this is important, is that resources are proportional to the number of time periods. So resources are scaling with the number of time periods. And this is well motivated in many applications. For example, in advertising, you have budgets that are large and then many time opportunities. In revenue management, you have like many opportunities to sell and also large inventories. So in that case, what we can show is that the regret of our algorithm when the step size is of the order of the square root of t, satisfy the following. We compare the opt versus the regret of our algorithm. And then we look at the supremum over all probability distributions, then we can show that this is of the order square root of t. In particular, what we can show is that this implies a synthetic optimality, is that if you compare the reward of our algorithm versus the expected reward of opt, this is going to converge to one as t goes to infinity. So then when you have more and more opportunities, you get closer to the optimal solution. And actually this bound is tight. There is a result from Androtto and Gurbich that show that in general, no algorithm can do better. So it's impossible to do better than square root of t regret without further assumptions on the input. And here we are not making a lot of assumptions on the input. Next, moving to the case of adversarial input. So what we show is that our algorithm is alpha asymptotic competitive in the sense that it asymptotically guarantees a fraction alpha of opt. What we mean is that for every input, hello? Oh. Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, can you hear me? Good, yeah, so my, my good. So yes, for every input, the ratio between our algorithm and an op goes to alpha, where t goes to infinity. And what is this competitive ratio? The competitive ratio, this is a parametric competitive ratio that depends on re how resource constraints you are. It depends on the ratio between b over t. Remember, this is how much you should spend on average. And this supremum over here, that's the maximum resource consumption. So it's the ratio of the average consumption to the highest possible consumption. If you are very resource constrained in the sense that your average is low and you can spend a lot, then, then this competitive ratio is gonna be lower. But if you have like more resources, then this competitive ratio is high. And actually this resource, this competitive ratio is tight for the bidding problem. We, um, in general, we can show that no algorithm can do better. This we, we prove in another paper using uh, Yao's lemma and, and and some 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 standard uh, techniques. And then what I want to mention as a disclaimer is that some algorithm can obtain be better competitive ratio. For example, in the case of the AdWord problem, that is an online matching problem with a very particular structure in which what happens is that rewards are proportional to resource consumption. If you have like this particular structure, then actually you can do better. You can obtain better competitive ratios, but then those algorithms that do well there necessarily need to perform poorly in the stochastic case. So then in some sense, there is a trade-off there that is inevitable. Now, in terms of robustness to adversarial corruption, what can we show? Let TD 
of delta be the set of independent distributions. So now we're going to allow distribution. Remember, before they were IID. Now let us assume that they are still independent, but not identical. We'll allow them to change over time. And we measure the total deviation in the following way. We look at the total deviation by looking at the difference between each distribution to the mean distribution. And then we, we measure the, the distance between the distribution to the mean using the total variation uh, metric, okay? And suppose that this is at most delta. So then what we can show is that the supremum among all distribution with this amount of deviation and we look at the regret of our algorithm is going to be square root of, of one half. And then we're going to have a term here that depends on the amount of corruption. So what's the idea here? In the IID case, all distributions are the same. So that means that the total deviation is going to be zero because all, all distributions are going to be equal to its mean. So in that case, you are fine. Now, suppose that the input is still independent, but you allow distributions to be different to each other. As they become different, then the, the total deviation is going to increase. And then the nice thing of our algorithm is that the performance is going to degrade gracefully with delta, with amount of deviation. You, you won't have like kind of a, a sharp increase, but you're going to have like the performance going to deteriorate gracefully. And these bounds are times as possible. Also, we have like a lower bound showing that no algorithm can do better. And this in particular implies uh, robustness to serial corruption. Then imagine that you have an adversary that you start with the IID input, but this adversary is going to corrupt delta requests. Then you can show that if you corrupt delta requests, then the total deviation is also going to be of order delta. So then that implies that the regret is going to be delta. So then when you increase the amount of corruption, the performance is going to degrade, but the amount of degradation is going to be linear. So then that's what we mean, like kind of uh, algorithm being uh, robust. And this I want to emphasize that some algorithms that I mentioned designed for IID input, many of the algorithms that have been previously considered in the literature that use this training-based uh, idea that you solve optimization problems using past data are very fragile and are not robust to serial corruption. Because if you corrupt a few time critical time periods, then performance won't be as good. And then in terms of non-stationary stochastic inputs, so as we discussed before about like markup change, suppose that requests like how autocorrelation. So this also will violate the IID assumption. And this is important because when you model, for example, a rival process of usage to a website of job to a server, in many cases, we, we want to allow for like autocorrelation. We want to use some autoregressive process. And then we can show that if the regret is fast mixing, then our algorithm achieves a regret of, again, square root of t. And we have an extra log t term that corresponds to the, to the mixing time of the of the Markov chain. So the, even if the input is not perfectly IID, if it's correlated, then things work out. And then finally, in the case of periodic inputs, as I mentioned, like in many cases, requests may exhibit seasonality or periodicity. What we can show is that if you have like this pattern that then we repeat with time, for example, as I mentioned before, suppose that you come, your horizon is a month, days tend to be similar along the week, but then in each day, mornings and evening are very different. So then this also will violate the IID assumption. But if these patterns repeat from one day to the next, then you can also show square root of t regret. So I'm running out of time. So I have some numerical experiments. So I, I don't want to, unfortunately, cannot discuss this. So let me go right to the conclusion. So then. Uh, what we discuss here is like online allocation problems, which we uh, try to make the point that they're central in OR and, and CS. And uh, we show that uh, they have like lots of applications. And we provide an algorithm based on mirror descent that is very simple, it's very easy to implement, it's flexible if we can incorporate different objective and constraint. Also, it's theoretically justified because we have like worst case guarantees. And the feature that we like the best beyond its simplicity is that a single algorithm performs well over various input models. In the stochastic case, adversarial case, corruptions, ergodicity, periodicity, you perform well, but also you perform well without knowing which input you're facing. It's not that you need to have like a hypothesis testing to check whether the input is adversarial or not, and then switch the behavior. The algorithm is extremely simple. You always do the same thing. And then regardless of the environment, you get like near optimal performance. 
And if you want to learn more about how we use dual mirror descent in the field, we have a, a, a blog post at Google AI uh, blog where we illustrate and we explain these ideas, how they are used in the field in the context of, of advertising. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, San Diego. And uh, any more questions from oh. the audience? <laughs> uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. May I ask another two questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, okay, the first is, um, may, can I just interpret the uh, why the reason that the, the algorithm is optimal uh, through the following uh, arguments? Um, that is that by you know uh, by by controlling the price of the resources into a, a average compute you know pre-computed uh, or um, control the um, consumption of the uh, the resource in uh, to uh, like average average resource we can actually sh uh, share the risk as well as the opportunity in the all time rounds. So it can be robust both, both to the uh, stochastic case and as well as the adversarial case. Yeah, so that actually is, is a very good point. And it's, it's driven a lot by the fact that we are trying to control expenditure. There, there are two things for this. One thing is that uh, what we can show, I, I didn't present this, uh, because I didn't have the, the time to go over this. But we can show like the following result is that the algorithm never deplete resources too early. Essentially, what we can show is that if you look at the node tau to be the first time that you reach out, run out of resources, then you're going to show that this always going to happen very close to the end of the horizon. The, and this actually has to do with the self-correcting feature. This guarantees that you share resources across time and no opportunity essentially consumes uh, too much. Okay, thanks. Oh, actually another question is respect to the reference function. Uh, will the choice of the reference function um, influence the, the results or uh, where, where does it influence? Good, good. Yeah, sure. so that's a good question. So, for example, uh, if you we, we in the in the paper we discuss concrete. So here in the, the regret bounds, I didn't give you the constants, but if you use a green descent of multiplicative weights, then you're gonna get roughly the same dependence. It's gonna be yeah the square root of t, and then the dependence on the number of resources. That's something that I didn't discuss. It's gonna be polynomial. Okay. Now, what you can do is that you can uh, constrain the dual space and optimize over a simplex if you have like a little bit more information. And in that case, if you use like kind of multiplicative weights by normalizing, you can get better dependence. You can get like something that is, is still, as we get here, we're going to get like a square root in the number of, of of time periods, but we can get logarithmic dependence on the number of resources. And this logarithmic dependence, if you are familiar with uh, mirror descent or like en 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 entropic descent, it has to do with the fact that when you're optimizing over the simplex, you can get like logarithmic uh, dependence on the number of decision variables. And then we, you can use some of these advantages of mirror descent to get better regret bounds, but you need a little bit more information about the problem structure. Okay, thanks. So it seems to me that it's, it is actually a quite general framework, but the sublinear results holds for almost all uh, reference functions. Yeah, almost all, yeah. You need to be careful. You need a reference function, again, to be like kind of strongly convex. Okay. Uh, so one, the one problem with reference function is that, for example, even in the case of, in the case of this, uh, Multiplicative weights here. The, the if you're familiar with mirror descent, the reference function for multiplicative weights is the negative entropy. Mm -hmm. And now the negative entropy, unfortunately, is not strongly convex in the whole space because the the it behaves almost linearly for large values. 
But then mm. we have a result here that they say that without loss, you can always restrict attention to a box. And then in a box, then things tend to be, if you don't go to infinity, if things are bounded, then most things are, are strongly uh, convex. So then if you use any function that is strongly convex in a box, then you can get the result. So yeah, so you actually you can use almost like lots of different updates uh, you can use beyond what we described here. Oh, that makes sense to me. Thanks. Thanks very Good. much. Thank you. I have a question, dear professor. Yes. Uh, I want to ask about the models, about the model assumptions. When you switch your input model from stationary distributions to adversarial distributions, do you need additional assumptions about um, anything? Uh, no, the only thing that we, we are assuming, I, I didn't mention this in, in, in the talk, is that we're assuming that the, the functions f and b are bounded. Uh, I mean, I read a paper before that uh, the learning in repeated, uh, learning to beat in repeated auctions. Uh, in that paper, you also proved the adversarial, uh, with, with, with respect to adversarial distributions and using, a, uh, assuming the continuous density functions. Uh -huh, in yeah, that yeah, paper, no, no. Good. You assume an upper bound and or or a lower lower bound about the density functions, but in this paper you consider the discrete. Uh, no, the, no, no, the I, actually, no. Actually, yeah. So yeah. So that that's a good point because in the other paper we assume that we needed like a sample. For example, in the stationary case we need like the the dual function to be like thrice differentiable and all these things. So the beauty is that here now this analysis is more general. And we don't need any of those assumptions. So then the only thing that we need is that the, the variables, uh, so that the function, for example, in the case of bidding, the only thing that we need is values to be bounded. And that's it. They could be continuous, they can be discrete, things don't need to be differentiable, they don't need to be strongly convex, nothing. So then those, those results, uh, again, have been like superseded by these ones because here we don't need, uh, they're much stronger here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank yeah, you. That's a very good question. So thank you for reading my papers. <laughs> uh, uh, dear Professor, I have another question too. Um, I want to ask uh, what's the, uh, what's the uh, re relationship between the regret and the dimension of this problem? Uh, 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 for example, in this problem, it might be uh, M and uh, and D, um, good. what's That's a, the relationship yeah. with that? That's a very good question. So then there are three parameters in terms of dimension. Like one is T, that we discussed the square root of T. One is M and one is D. Now the nice thing is that D does not appear at all. No dependence in general on D. So D can be like even infinite dimensional and things could work here. If you have like things properly bounded. So we have some conditions on the norm, but there's no implicit dependence on D. But we do have dependence on, on M. And that depends on the, as I mentioned before, that depends on the regularizer that you use. So for example, in green descent, I think the dependence, if I re remember correctly, I think the dependence was two thirds. Uh, and, but then you can get this to, uh, instead of being N to the two thirds, you can get it to logarithmic if you put, if you restrict attention to the simplex in the dual space and do something more sophisticated. So the, the, again, square root of T, it can be polynomial or logarithmic of M and there in general, there's no dependence on, on D. Uh, okay, thank you. So the uh, reason that there's no in, uh, dependence on D is because the main dimension we care about is the dimension of B and uh, is that right? So yeah. Um, so then, yeah. so then this is different than a banded problem because we don't have banded feedback. So this is an important thing. So here, remember when you you receive the reward function and the consumption function, and after receiving this, you take an action. So then this is like kind of what is called like sometimes like kind of uh, first order feedback. No, because you receive this before taking an action. Banded problems are like kind of sort of three-year-old feedback because before taking an action, 
you don't know what's going to happen. So that forces you to explore a lot. And that's why you get dependence on the number of like kind of our actions. Here, because we don't have like kind of uh, that feedback, we have like a stronger feedback is that we, because why we can get like better, uh, better dependency. Does it make sense? Uh, and uh, thank you. And I want to ask that the main uh, cause about the regret on this dimension is, is it because that the update uh, we use a, a lack of subgradient way and the subgradient is uh, is the, the convergence speed is related to this uh, dimension. Is that the main reason that uh, the regret is related to this dimension? Yeah, yeah, I guess essentially why this works, this has to do with, if you are familiar with online commerce optimization, is that this uh, one component of the regret bound and the main component actually is driven by the regret of mirror descent. And the regret of mirror descent actually depends on on t and it depends on the number of of resources that that's the number of dual variables dual variables you see but in mirror descent we're not using the primal decisions only the dual variables so that's kind of why primal decisions do not appear in the dual in the in the bounds because we're using bound for mirror descent that only depends on dual variables because we are using mirror descent in the dual space. So that's kind of the advantage of optimizing over the dual space. Okay, so is there any, uh, sorry. So if, if we want to improve this problem, we might result to some other uh, method uh, other than the mirror descent. Is that? Yeah, right? so actually in the paper, we, we showed that. We showed that our theory, if you're using mirror descent, if you want to use another first order method, and under general, for example, you can use like Adam or Adagrad or other things. You can do that too. And it seems to us that that does not lead to better regret guarantees. Uh, but again, it could be the case that yes, but you need to be something clever. So that's an interesting research direction, actually. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Any other more questions? Um, yes ask the final questions sorry for so many questions but no, it, no, it, just, fine, yeah. it just reminds me that uh in in the setting uh you also mentioned the the ergotic inputs that which is uh um markov a Mar markovian on the line uh, in in the on the uh, 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 uh you know the, which is actually a markovian uh so here's uh, some brainstorming um, where, where the results connect, uh, be connected to some, uh, some results in the like Mar Markov uh, decision processes, which is usually uh, being used um, to model uh, in the multi-agent, uh, in the reinforcement learning framework. Uh, yes, but not really because what we are, so this is important. And why is this important? Because I'm assuming that the Markov chain is exogenous. So essentially, imagine the Markov chain is governing the distribution of requests, but it's not affected by my actions. Oh, okay. Oh. So then my actions do not impact the Markov chain. Now, okay. if in, in reformed learning, then your actions, your X, are going to impact the, the stochastic process. And then in that case, that's reformed learning. So this is not reformed learning for that reason because that markup chain is exogenous. So it's a very subtle point, but if you're familiar with the reformist learning, you're gonna realize that that's the difference here. Okay, so so the, actually my actions will not influence the, 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 the states of the future rounds. Correct, that's exactly, okay. and that's why this is not a reformist learning problem. Okay, thanks. Good, thank you. Good. Any more questions? Yeah, maybe it's a time to get yeah. a break. <laughs> and, uh, thanks. Good. And good. A lot of people, like uh, people are very interested. In, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for the questions. It's always uh, fun to to present my work and. Uh, and receive questions. So there's a lot of excitement from my part too. So hopefully we can meet in person at some point. But yeah. 
uh, in lieu of that, I think it's, it's, it's good that we are we can meet in, in this way. So right. it was my pleasure right. to get to know you. Right. 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 Yeah, I actually come back when when Beijing is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I was in Beijing uh, 2018, actually, for, for a oh. conference. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to take some time. But hopefully in the future, we, 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 we can meet again. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See you. Bye-bye.